wish you a very blessed service of worship as we come together. Uh, happy Father's Day to many of you. Uh, you know, it's just a special day. I'm just going to read a prayer that I read uh, concerning a young man toward his father. A prayer for my dad. Dear God, I gratefully thank you for giving me my dad. You must really love me because you gave me the best you had. Watch over him, Lord, and keep him in your care. And may he feel my love for him in my humble heart. Don't prayer. Amen. Um, no, of us, I know our fathers are, you know, passed away and everything else, but we can certainly think back and say, wow, you really did give me a great man in my life. And may we all be thankful for our fathers and you know, just praise God for all that he has done for us. As we come together on this day, we open by using our blue hymn, hymn 68, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. <laughs>
The saying is sure and worthy of full acceptance that Jesus came into this world to save sinners. Christ himself came and bore our sin in his body on the cross so that free from sin we might live for righteousness. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Since God has forgiven you in Christ, let us forgive one another. The peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen and amen. We all would. 
Amazingly, though, Job never lost faith. But his questions were some, some questions that, you know, sometimes our questions are like, you know, more than why are you doing this, God, or why are you letting this happen? You know, God, don't you know? You know he, and, it, and so God comes back and he finally just says, okay, Job, if you have a total understanding, answer me this question. How does the universe work? You know, and you know, we we know that there's stars and everything else, but I'm gonna give you a question. I don't know how scientific this is. If you go out in the middle of a dark night and the stars are shining, what's the most stars you can see at one point in time? At least the guy I read said 9,600. You'll never see more stars than that. I mean you might Span with your eyes, but in one vision you will see 9,600 stars at the moment. That's an interesting fact. But God set that up. God set that up. And he put this planet, you know, which doesn't seem to have anything supporting it in the universe, but yet it stays. It rotates. God set that up. So be awed by our God and all that he has done for us. We rise to hear, no, actually I said that wrong. I'm going to preach in the gospel, so I'm going to read this 2 Corinthians 6, 1 to 13. You can stay down. Sorry. Working together with him then, we appeal to you not to receive the grace of God in vain. For he says, in a favorable time I listened to you, and in a day of salvation, I have helped you. Behold, now is the favorable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. We put no obstacle in anyone's way, so that no fault may be found with our ministry. But as servants of God, we commend ourselves in every way, by great endurance in affliction, hardship, calamities, beatings, imprisonments, riots, labors, sleepless nights, hunger, by purity, knowledge, patience, kindness, the Holy Spirit, genuine love. By truthful speech and the power of God with the weapons of righteousness for the right hand and for the left. Through honor and dishonor, through slander and praise, we are treated as impostors and yet are true. As unknown and yet well known, as dying and behold, we live. As punished and yet not killed, as sorrowful, yet always rejoicing, as poor, yet making many rich, as having nothing, yet possessing everything. For we, we have truly spoken to you, Corinthians, our heart is wide open. You are not restricted by us, but you are restricting your own affections. In return, I speak as to children, widen your hearts also. You know, so open up your hearts and minds to hear the word of God. And, you know, know that, you know, Proverbs says, my ways are not your ways. You know, so we have our ways. We, we can think in the way of the world very easily, but we follow God's way as, as people of God. We continue with our next hymn, which is in our blue hymnal, hymn 476, I Meet Thee Every Hour. Thank you.
come before you to hear your word. May we truly hear it. May we truly take the truth of your word into our hearts, minds, and into our day-to-day -day life. May we be lifted up and strengthened as we go forth and have that peace that passes all understanding. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our text comes from Mark chapter 4, verses 35 to 41, and reads, On that day, when evening had come, Jesus said to them, Let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd, they took him with them in the boat, just as he was. And other boats were with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves were breaking into the boat, so that the boat was already filling. But he was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. And they woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And he awoke and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. He said to them, Why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with a great fear and said to one another, Who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? This is our text. As we come to this story, you know, I pray that for myself and for you that, you know, we hear the story, but we really kind of hear it at a, at a level that, wow, God really is worthy of praise and worship. You know, we get a little deeper, so to speak. So this is very early in Jesus' ministry. The disciples are with him. They've seen him do great things. Um, and, you know, they're, they're kind of in awe of him, but, you know, he's definitely the rabbi. And so we come to this story, and Jesus has been preaching, doing miracles, and so there's a lot of people there. And he's preaching from the boat. And maybe this is my picture, you know, they... They back the boat into the shore, and he's standing on the back until that's the stern, the back of the boat. And he's preaching, so, and you know, his voice is going out, and people are hearing him, and, you know, it's evening. And he says to them, and this is important, you might not have caught this in the real quick reading. He says to them, let's go to the other side. They could have walked. But let's get in the boats and let's go to the other side. And there's more than one boat, so maybe the 12 plus a few more people. And they're going out. And, and Jesus is tired. So we see the fully human side of Jesus. He's tired. And he takes a good nap. And I'm going to say he fell into a good sleep here. And they're going out, and the, the Sea of Galilee is producing a pretty good storm, or God is producing a pretty good storm. And, I, and you know, at least four of these guys are fishermen on the Sea of Galilee. They understand this lake, and they're concerned. You know, just realize a couple of geography things, so to speak. Not too far away is the Mediterranean Sea, which is big enough to produce its own weather climate, and it carries over. The Sea of Galilee is below sea level, surrounded by hills, and so when that cool weather comes over and it changes everything, storms do and can come up very, very quickly. And this must have been a doozy. So you can kind of picture the disciples in these, this boat. Jesus is sleeping there, and the boat is shaking and everything else, and finally they wake him up. Because they're scared. And they say, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Now, I'm going to say this. The fear that, is, you know, they're, they're, they're awake. They're, they're fearful. They have what is, in the Greek, is called a deloi-type fear. This is a, a cowardness, a timidness. And we all experience this type of fear. A um, couple examples, maybe. I've had people tell me that when they come into this church at night, and 
high percentage of you have keys. You know, they forgot something here. But coming to the church at night, and this is a big, dark building, and, you know, especially in the winter times, the pipes will make noise, and if a car goes by, it'll create some pretty good shadows and everything else. And, you know, it, they'll say, it's just kind of freaky to be in here. And, you know, they quickly get their stuff and get back to their car and drive away. And that quickly, that fear is gone. That's okay. Uh, you're out walking and a big dog comes running out at you. And as <gasps> soon as the dog is under control, you're back to normal. It's, there's a situation that causes, you know, a fear. You know, and I think it's kind of natural. And these guys feel they're about to die, and so they wake Jesus up. Now, think about this. Why did they wake Jesus up? They're shocked that he calms the sea. So I don't think they woke him up to calm the sea. I think they're waking him up to say, okay, Jesus, help us get this water out of the boat. Grab a bucket. Start doing some work, Jesus. We need your help, Jesus. Or maybe they're saying, Jesus, you better wake up because we're going to die and you better make sure you're right with God. I, I, but they wake him up. And, you know, that's pretty, pretty understandable and everything like that, but they, they, they wake him up. But I want you to catch this. Jesus said, let's go to the other side. Jesus is bringing them into this situation. And you say, why would God do that? Why would God bring them into this situation? And you hear me say this phrase quite often. God is giving these guys a character-building experience. Romans 5. You know, we should rejoice in those difficult times because they produce character. Character produces perseverance, and perseverance. Per so he's, he's, he's giving them this character-building experience to say, okay, guys, it's tough, I know, but I'm here for you. Know that I'm here for you. And they have to be brought into that hope, that that perseverance, that strengthening of it. God did this on purpose to train them to go to Jesus, to come to Jesus. And they have this fear. And they, they, they wake him up. That it's interesting. Also, don't you care that we're perishing? I think it's a great question because when we're going through a difficult time, probably very much like Job was, you know, it's, it's real easy to say, don't you care, God? God, you promised to be with me. And he is with you. And he does care. Know that with all your heart, mind, and soul, that he does care. But they're in a situation that is pretty scary. So Jesus is asleep on this pad or something. I, I kind of think it's kind of a canvas to cover the boat up and stuff. But he's asleep on this thing, and they wake him up, and I can just kind of, you know, the boat is being tossed all over the place. It's filling up with water. He wakes up, and they're frightened, and he goes, and if you read different versions of the Bible, I love this one. It's like a paraphrase. Shut up! He literally tells the storm to shut up. He tells the sea to stop. You know, it, it, but it's, it, it's an emphasis. And boom. The sea is calm and quiet. Then what happens? Jesus kind of rebukes the disciples. Why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? And it's like, you've, you've seen me do these miracles. You should know that I can take care of you. But you have no faith. And catch this in verse 41. And they are filled with great fear. Why do they now have a great fear? Well, they're, 
once again being brought into a reality that this Jesus is God. And they're kind of knowing it. You know, let's just go with the idea that they know their Bible pretty well. And the Psalms, you know, just if you want, Psalm 89, Psalm 107 are two great examples of only God can control the sea and the water. So when Jesus says, shut up to the sea, and it shuts up, you're like, wow, who is this guy? You know, they're saying, who is this guy? But they're also probably saying, is this really God? Now, the Greek word for this great fear is aphabethesan. Now, that might not mean much to you, and I, my Greek is, I have it written here in Greek, and my Greek might be a little weak here, but you might have heard the word phobia in that form of Greek fear. Now, we sometimes hear the word phobia, and we jump to this, it's an irrational fear. You know, so... I come into this church when it's dark all the time and hear the pipes and I never have a fear. So I can almost in one sense of the word say, if you come in here and you're afraid, no. Your fear is very real. I listened to a guy talk about his three-year-old son this last week. And he said, my son has got the most irrational fear. He'll sit there and he'll pick up a snake and look at it and do everything else with it. But if he's in the room with a fly, he'll run all that room screaming. You know, and you guys are laughing. It sounds irrational, but it's very real to that child. So we have this great fear. But we, you know, the Bible verse from Proverbs and Psalms says the beginning of wisdom is fear of the Lord. And you know, we, we have that, and we, we, it contains a lot of different things. But one of the things is you're filled with awe of this type of fear. So the disciples are, they're filled with awe when they see Jesus calm the storm. But it also carries with it a fear. I read another story, and I, I love this one. Because this guy must be about the same age as me. When he was a little kid, his favorite basketball player was Michael Jordan. No. Michael Jordan, MJ, you know, great basketball player. I mean, he would have considered himself to be the number one Michael Jordan fan. So one day during the offseason, Michael Jordan came to this place to, to talk. You know, like a club. And uh, so he talked a couple of his friends to go with him to this place. To see Michael Jordan, and he, you know, he's going to get to hear Michael Jordan talk. So they're going into the building. So they're coming in this way, and lo and behold, Michael Jordan is coming in from this side, a little bit behind him. So they're all going into the sidewalk there, but when they realize Michael Jordan's back there, they kind of part ways, and so that Michael Jordan would come in there. So. This kid is in the front row, his buddies are behind him, and he's watching Michael Jordan come to him. This is funny, I think. One of his buddies pushed him right into Michael Jordan. His face came right into Michael Jordan's belly. At that moment, he said, I understood fear and awe all in the same moment. I thought Michael Jordan was a great basketball player. But when you think of God, Jesus, putting these planets here, there, with no seeming support system, and placing all these stars in the sky, that's a reason to be awed by our God. But he's so great, so fantastic, that it can also carry a slight fear with it. And yet, and that's probably a good thing. Because we're just so in awe of 
what Jesus has done. And, you know, they're, they're in awe of him because he just calmed the storm. This is before he died on the cross and rose victorious over sin, death, and Satan, which is something even greater. And we should be filled with awe and a fear, saying, wow, this is Jesus. And you're right there with him. And that this truth is hitting the disciples as they're filled with this great fear, this awe of who Jesus is. And they're starting to gather, yeah, this is the Messiah. This is the one who's going to save the world. This is the one who does care if I'm perishing. Don't you care that we are perishing? The disciples ask that question in a very physical sense. But Jesus' biggest concern is the fact that without him, you and I are perishing spiritually. Because of Jesus' life, death, resurrection, he's shown how much he cares for you. And you go from perishing being saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. So in one sense of the word, the fear that we have, you know, of whatever it might be, I have a massive fear of alligators. That might not seem very rational here in eastern Colorado, but uh, I, it's very real. When we have this Great fear of God. It's a, it's a, and this is the difference between the two fears. The one of them comes and goes with an event. And, and get rid of this irrational fear thought with the word phobia. Get rid of that. Your phobias are always with you. Your fear and awe of God, the beginning of wisdom is fear of the Lord. It is always with you. It's part of your character. So we're always looking to Jesus for forgiveness of sin and everlasting life. And he's with us. Thus, you have peace. Because you are forgiven by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. You're no longer perishing. And you can go about your life with the joy and peace. In Jesus' name. Amen. We continue with him 408. I am thine, O Lord.
saved in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, life of life, very God of very God, begotten of God. King of what substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us sin and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and of the Amen, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again in accordance to the Scriptures and ascended into heaven. And sit at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again with glory to judge the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped in the world of life, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in our holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge the baptism for the remission of sins, and I live for the resurrection of the dead, and the life of the world to come. Amen. Heavenly Father, we come before you today and we say thank you. You give us these character building experiences that we don't always like, but you do it in love to have us grow in our faith, our love, our dependence on you. We thank you for them and pray that we would be built up in the one true faith. May the Holy Spirit, may the Holy Word reach into our hearts and minds with this truth and give us a peace that only you can give. We also come before you, Heavenly Father, and pray that you would watch over and bless these named individuals as they go about their lives and, you know, upcoming situations, health issues, and stuff like that. Bless them and their families. We name Heather Van Marth, Catherine Davis, Ron Flirty, Judy Conrad, Billy Horning, Joellen Stout, Mary Coblazer, Agnes Audley, Tina Suar, Michelle Diaz, Kaylin France, Leonard Dutton, Irma Shaw, Vanessa Warden, Sid Gibbs, Arlen Tanner, Laura Washi, Charlie Wallstrom, Bev County, Rick Sawley, Chad Jensen, Bonnie Willis, Linda Morrow, Thatcher and Taya Flock, Ron Scott, Jerita Henry, Grant Dinas, Ray Elmerson, Jim Abbey, Roger Bloom, Sharon Cohen. We also pray, Heavenly Father, that you would watch over our military men and women. We name Andrew Burton, Patricia Callahan, Josh Flirty, Colin Whitnock, Colin Medley, and Colby Ross. Bless all these men and women. You know, many are certainly in harm's danger each day. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you would bless the moms and dads that raised your children up to know Jesus Christ. Lift them up and give them that peace that as they grow up, they may know that you were with them always to the end of the age. Be with the fathers on this special day and lift them up too. And, you know, let them know that they are loved by their children, but mostly that you were loved by them. We also pray that you would give us the wisdom to lead us and guide us. Instill your wisdom into the hearts and minds of our leaders, that they may lead us in a godly way. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. We pray together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to his disciples and said, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given to you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to his disciples and said, 
Take and drink. This is my blood of the New Testament, which is given to you for the forgiveness of all your sin. Do this in remembrance of me.
things are. I'm going in to the new at the proper stand. I'll just, tomorrow night is parish planning, um, 7 o'clock here. You know, try to have somebody from each committee here. Um, if you'd like, you can give me, tell me that I can call you and I will call you and kind of let you be a part of it that way. Um, but I wish you the Lord's blessings. Have a great day. Please join us for fellowship and everything. See you right there.